on some of that. Um, I'm particularly excited about the talks that are sort of talking about general purpose tools that we can all use as opposed to particular applications, um, which of course excludes my talk, but that's all right. Um, so <laughs> welcome all. Uh, let's get started. Our first speaker is uh, Philip Ellison. Uh, he's a scientific software uh, engineer at the UK Met office. Uh, he's one of the core developers on Matplotlib, and he works on Iris and CardoPy, which he'll be talking to us about right now. Hi, everybody. So um, as Chris said, I'm Philip Elson from the UK Met Office. Um, I'm a scientific software engineer. Um, and recently, the, the Met Office has become a big user of the Py scientific Python stack. Uh, I think we've now got over 300 active um, scientific researchers using Python. Uh, and to support that, we have a team of uh, scientific software engineers to uh, streamline and, and improve the um, scientific software that's available to them. So that's what my talk's about today. I'm, I'm going to talk about two uh, packages that we've developed um, called Iris and Cartify. Um, so one of the big problems that the Met Office um, has had in the past um, relates to the number of file formats that we have to deal with. Uh, so we've got um, yeah, NetCDF, GRIB, and, and there's quite a few kind of custom file formats that have come out of the Met Office in the past. I'm sure you guys have got similar problems. Uh, so our scientists would often write analysis routines and visualization routines as well, uh, which were um, highly, highly tailored towards um, specific metadata from, from those files. And when a new data source came online or uh, some, someone tweaked the, uh, the output of that data, the analysis routines failed to work, and um, they often either needed refactoring or a complete rewrite. So to get around that, we've implemented a, a file format agnostic data model. Uh, it's n-dimensional, um, and it's specific, specifically for gridded data at this stage. Um, and the package that, that implements that is called IRIS. Um, and the data model within IRIS is a cube. Um, those who are familiar with CFNet CDF will be pretty familiar with the cube itself. Um, we've borrowed heavily from, from that, that community, and in fact, we've been working with the CF community to um, try to kind of abstract a little bit from the NetCDF specifics that are within the spe specification. Okay, so I'm going to get to some code. Oh, this is a team, by the way. Um, it kind of uh, gets to about uh, seven full-time developers after kind of working on side projects and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm going to get some some live live demo. So the interface is pretty simple. You just give a file name to this load, load cube function here. Um, and it doesn't matter what type of file you've got. It could be an etcdf file, it could be a grib file, um, or it could be uh, any number of the files that, that the, the MetOffice produces. Um, but the interface is the same. So you just load your cube, and you get an iris cube from that. Um, we can print the cube, and you kind of get used to, to reading this output. Um, but it's a, it represents um, air temperature data, which is in kelvins. Um, and it's, uh, it's got three orthogonal dimensions, 240 time steps, 37 latitudes, and 49 longitudes there. There's some extra metadata associated with that. Um, we've got an auxiliary forecast period coordinate, some scalar data, uh, a dictionary of attributes, and then some information about the processing that's already happened on that file, on that cube. Um, so it's kind of array-like, um, and as you'd expect, you can index on, on this cube in the same way that you can with a NumPy array. And the result itself is another cube. So I've just taken out the first time step here, uh, the first dimension, and you'll see that the time dimension's no longer listed up here. And in fact, it's become one of the, the scalar coordinates down here. Um, so one of the kind of uh, keystone um, concepts within Iris is that your analysis operates on a cube, and the result itself is a cube. Um, so we've implemented, in this case, I'm going to just take the, uh, the, the latitude, um, the mean of the latitude uh, on the data. So take the zonal mean of, of air temperature, essentially. And you'll see that we, that was on the, uh, on the original cube that we had that was three-dimensional. Um, and we now lose the, the latitude dimension. 
Um, I'll move that up. And we've gained a scalar latitude coordinate, which is bounded and represents the, um, the values that the original uh, larger cubes latitudes represented. Importantly, you, in, you should note that we also gained some um, information about the um, processing that's happened to this cube. So in this case, we've gained a, a mean uh, of latitude cell method. So as you did expect, you can plot cubes. Um, and we've got two plotting modules in Iris. There's Iris plot and Iris quick plot. Um, plot is pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping of matplotlib functions such as contour, or pcolor mesh, contour f. And quick plot um, is the same um, mapping almost, except it adds some extra things like um, it will automatically add a title for you and a color bar and put some um, labels on the, on the axes of the plot. So if I just do a contour now of that, that first time step that I sliced out earlier with 50 levels, and do an extra bit of um, mapping. Oh, my figures are too big. Uh, you'll see that I've got uh, a plot which has a title um, and a color bar, and the color bar has, has units associated with it. And I didn't actually specifically ask for the color bar. It's just that I'm using the quick plot um, functions. There's nothing specific to uh, kind of latitude, longitude dimensions. So you could equally do uh, identical code um, on the zonal mean that we calculated, the, the two-dimensional time versus longitude plot, um, again with 50 levels. And you get a, lo a longitude time plot of Muller diagram with, with a nice color bar and um, labels. Sorry, the plots are a bit big. OK, um, we've implemented some um, interpolation schemes in IRIS, all built on top of kind of SciPy, NumPy, and those kind of tools. Um, and in this case, I'm just going to extract the nearest neighbor point um, from the big cube, um, which was three-dimensional time, latitude, longitude. And this is for the nearest point to, to Austin. So you see, it's, it's now a one-dimensional cube of a time series, essentially, 240 time steps. Um, we've got the nearest latitude longitude to the, to the point that I requested. Um, and then you can uh, do things like plot, plot that cube. You see it's pretty noisy, so a, kind of a common um, operation on that would be to take a, a rolling mean of, of the data just to smooth out the data a little bit. So we've implemented a rolling window method. Um, and that just takes the coordinate that you want to take the rolling window of, the aggregator that you want to apply to that, and the, the length of the window that you're interested in. So in this case, I've taken a 10-year rolling, rolling mean. And again, I've plotted it um, here. And the output is kind of, kind of big, but you get the, the labels and, and a nice legend. And, and all that was from kind of three lines, four lines of, of code. Um, you're probably wondering, um, you know, we've got a time series here, and this is Python, and if you've got time series in Python, you want to be using pandas, and we agree. Um, so there's some metadata that pa pandas can't handle, uh, like the cell methods and that kind of thing. But we have um, a function so that you can export your cube into a, a pandas time series. So that's the 1D cube again, uh, exported as a pandas time series. Um, and then you can do whatever you want, whatever pandas can do with that, um, you can do. So I could do, a, 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 again, a plot. But notice there's no title or anything like that because pandas doesn't have that metadata. OK, that's kind of a, a whistle-stop tour of Iris. Uh, the user guide is pretty um, comprehensive. It's how we um, educate our own users um, in the office. I won't follow through, um, and it's um, it's well worth a read if you're if you're interested in this. I strongly recommend you read through it. So the other problem that we've um, we we found in the office, particularly when writing Iris actually and, and writing the plotting uh, wrappers, 
was that we were find, finding there was a lot of problems with date lines on the, um, on the base map outputs. Um, and we had to work around that quite a lot. There were some situations, uh, certainly some projections that base map didn't handle that we really needed. And it's kind of uh, led us to develop Cartopine. The kind of two main points here um, are we've got OO projection definitions and uh, we've got genuine point line, polygon, and image transformations between projections. And that's quite a powerful um, tool for the GIS um, users amongst you. So we typically import a uh, Cartopi coordinate reference system, uh, CCRS. And using the standard um, matplotlib axes function, you can just pass through a CCRS instance to the projection keyword. Um, and this axes object that it creates now has um, Cartopi methods, so set global, stock image, grid lines, coastlines. If I run that, we should get um, a map. Uh, but the real power is that we can change uh, this to any other projection that Cartopi has implemented. So um, if I pick the Mulvida projection. Uh, a more wider plot with exactly the same commands. Um, for those of you who uh, like quirky map projections, uh, it's not really that applicable to um, the science that we need to apply, but it, it was a real great test of our polygon and, and uh, image transformation framework. Um, we've implemented interrupted good Molazine projection. And we get you know exactly the same code produces but the same styled map. Okay. Uh, for the, those of you that were at Kelsey's uh, geospatial tutorial uh, on Tuesday, uh, there was a great map um, that Sky had published, which took um, the, a flight from Hawaii to Hong Kong via Africa. Um, and this is a, a great exercise. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I, I did it in, in Cartopine. So we were given the, um, the city locations and, and basically um, you zip, zip together the coordinates into X and Y arrays, set up a, an axis with, in this case, we'll set a, a Robinson projection centered at the longitude of Austin. Uh, we'll set up a global map, draw the cities with blue stars um, and draw lines between those cities um, the key really is uh, that you give the transform of the coordinates that you're talking about. So in this case, that's kind of... Um, you give the coordinate system of the, of the coordinates that you're talking about. And you end up with a plot that um, kind of does the right thing, goes to the right place. Um, and you'll notice that um, from, uh, where is it, uh, Hong Kong to, to Moscow, the, the line goes around the back of the, of the map. Um, if you've used any packages like base map, um, if you're lucky enough for the line to go around the back, you'll often find that it joins from here over to here, and you know, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, but Cartopies handle that properly. Um, if you wanted to uh, uh, kind of lines, sh lines of shorter distance, um, then you can just change the projection that the the lines are in, um, great circle lines that is, sorry. Um, hopefully we get nice simple um, geodetic lines. Okay. Um, so we've already seen a um, Cartopine map. That was with the IRIS demo. Um, if I run that again, we'll see it. It was this one here. Um, but the real beauty is that it doesn't matter what projection you want your map in, the data can just be thrown against it. So in this case, I'm going to pick a real nasty um, projection. I'm going to pick um, Mulvider, but I'm going to put Austin at, at the side of the, the map. And that, that's going to split the contour in two, essentially. Now, it's not particularly useful, um, but it just shows the flexibility of the um, the dateline handling in, 
in Cartify. Um, and you could pick any projection you want and the data will just work. I've not had to reproject the data up front. Okay, so the, the real power of the OO projection definitions comes when you've, you want to implement a projection that Cartify hasn't yet done that maps to Proj4. So this is an example. I wanted to plot some, um, some satellite imagery from a geostationary uh, satellite. So I um, defined a, a geostationary projection, kind of 15, 20 lines, I guess. And once you've done that, um, you can use that in Cartify. So I've, I now pass that thing through to the Matplotlib axis uh, projection keyword. Um, I do some stuff. I, I've got the image um, in PNG format. Um, and I simply just do an image show. Um, set the extent of the image that it, that's being represented and say the projection of that image. That's where I'm from, by the way. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, the, just defining a projection like that, um, and you can instantly use it, is really powerful. Um, I just wanted to show you that you're not bound to, with images, because we've got image transformations, um, you're not bound to sticking with, with that projection. So I can just pick another projection. And hopefully, um, it'll reproject the image on the fly um, without me having to do anything. That's about it. Um, I guess my main motivation for coming here today was to let you know that Iris and Cartify exist um, and that the Met Office is working with the scientific Python stack and you know, we're kind keen to make um, the whole process easier to use. Um, yeah, we'd love people to be using Iris and Cartify, um, feedback and as they say, pull requests welcome. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's in Cartify, um, and it's actually um, it transforms the the image pixels into a spherical representation, and then it's using it's using a three D nearest neighbor um, from SciPy actually SciPy Interpolate, um, so you get a full uh, spherical representation of the image, and it reprojects nicely. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I guess when you get to the edges of, um, in this case, the geostationary projection, it's kind of the big pixels and the don't really. Uh, yeah, exactly. It doesn't really. Yeah. Exactly that. So let's say I want to have a lot of people with um, and maybe email people to do that with Iris. And could you do it with Iris? Yeah, I mean, it's just. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the wrappers that I showed you, they were they um, they call PyPlot underneath. Um, and so you can do whatever you can do with PyPlot on top of that. Um, yeah, and the same with Cartify. So you can you can use the Cartify stuff, and then you can use axes coordinates if you want on top of that to draw you know, certain certain things wherever you want.
don't know. If, if, if it's possible to use the metadata from an iris cube and still make use of Pandas functionality, I'd be very interested in that, definitely. Maybe we should speak offline. Great. Thank you. Yes, um, so uh, we've worked quite closely to try and develop the um, CF data model, which isn't the NetCDF CF data model. Um, so it's completely abstract CF from NetCDF itself. And that, that's still ongoing, it's not finished, but the iris cube is our kind of representation of, of what we think, where we think that's going. And it is our intention to uh, move towards whatever's specified in that in that CF data model specification.